Doesn't speech also create chaos out of order? It does. Most archaic archetypal heroes, confront chaos, a monster, which represents the unexplored things, they're threatening and destructive but also offers us infinite potential. More elaborated hero stories, order has become so corrupt and rigid, that free speech fragments it into its parts, so that can rejuvenate itself. Like the Gospels, Christ is the thing that stands against the corrupt state and rejuvenates it through speech. So, free speech, the logos, is the thing that mediates between chaos and order. E.g. Taoist, chaos and order, yin and yang, masculine and feminine. Order, wherever you go, there are things you understand. Chaos, wherever you go, there are things you don't understand. Being is made out of chaos and order, and it's always that way. Tao is the symbol of being per esse. Your brain is adapted, it's partly why it has two hemispheres. The world you don't understand being handled by the left. The world you understand being handled by the right. The line down the middles, that's Tao, that's meaning. And if you have one foot in chaos and one foot in order, you're maximizing information flow. And rejuvenating yourself at the same time you're maintaining your structure. And you will report on that internally as engagement in the world. It's the most fundamental orienting sense that you have, deeply instantiated neurologically. From an evolutionary perspective. Reality is chaos and order. When we have a dialogue. We're attempting to climb towards the truth. Instead of convincing each other that we're right. We're engaging in simultaneous fragmentation of old and archaic belief systems and they're updated. The person and you will click together. Which is the death of an old conceptualization structure. Disintegration and then reconfiguration in a tighter order. That's a truthful conversation, a meeting of the minds and soul. It's curative, all psychotherapist knows this. They help people face the things that they're most afraid of, so they can overcome them. Is to allow them to tell someone the truth. What happened to you? I'll listen. They take themselves apart, and put themselves together. By speaking the truth about what happened. Psychotherapy. Find what you're afraid and avoiding, and help you confront it, you gather that information. Lay your story of catastrophe with detail, to straighten yourself out through speech. It's the spiritual purpose of a marriage, as well. You face someone who's different than you. That you're tied to, and cannot run from. Because if you can run from someone, they will never show you their true face. Because if someone shows you their true face, you will run. So, you say in a marriage ceremony. I will allow you to show me your true face, and I will not run. Unless you mean that, you'll never be married. You'll never understand what it means. And never reap the benefits, which are practical, spiritual, and psychological. There's a reason for the vow, but it has to be a vow. Otherwise, you have a back door open. And you'll never really tell the person what you're like. No bloody wonder. Who really want to know who you're like, not even you. How can I embed altruism more in my natural state of being? You mean. How people overcome their proclivity to only act on their own behalf. Okay. Primary religious injunction. Treat the other person like you would like to be treated yourself. Does not mean, be nice to other people or sacrifice yourself excessively for other people. It means think about the other person as if they were you. So, both can interact better at the same time. We're all equally valuable. Then you think, how do you remind yourself of that? Trough terror, because is the genuine motivator. Fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. It means, you don't get away with anything. Jung. The higher morality. As well as Piaget. We start out as individuals. Then we learn to play with other children, that made them social. So, our society is a giant game. They learn how to play dash learn the rule dash how to speak the rules dash realize they were the creators of the rules, that's moral development. And Jung conceptualized it symbolically. You exist so your conceptual structures and emotions are in uneasy relationship with one another. You're like a house divided between yourself. So, you have to put together your mind and your emotions, you they work as a unit. You do that being forthright about what you really want. So, you're a unified entity of emotion and thought. You take that entity into your body, and bring those things together. That's the psychological equivalent of the incarnation. Integrated spirit, mind, and body. Your emotions plus motivations plus capacity of thinking, and you act out those things. You take that in opposition to the world. Then you realize there's no opposition with the world is a disturbance in your field of being, it's you. All the problems that are in the world, it's you. So, you stop thinking about the opposition between what's good for you and what's good for the world. Because there's no difference. It's not easy to configure yourself between what's good for you, in your moral limited domain with what's good for everyone. But there's in technical difference between them. E.g. If I'm in a psychotherapeutic dialogue. 
if I'm doing it properly. We're learning together. If I help them to solve one of their problems. I myself solve one of my problems. They bring the terrible things that goes wrong with people in life. These are not things that happen to them, these things happen to everyone. And to figure out how to solve that for them, it's to figure out how to solve it for yourself. So, if you think you're something different from your wife. It's an error. You're tied together so tightly. That if something happens to one, inevitable happens to the other. The terror emerges when you realize that those problems, that you don't address, magnified by your behavior, by your own interest. Those will come back to haunt you. If you do it right. You are more afraid of acting selfishly, than you are willing to do it. I'm not doing that, if I do that it will bring hell, and I'm not going there. That element of terror it's good. Aim at the good and run from what's terrible, then you're motivated. Could you trace a narrative origin for postmodernism? It's an archetypal reality. There's a force that opposes to logos. That's the hostile brothers. Hostility between the two primary modes of operating in the world. This is the modern manifestation of that. It's useful to be challenged, it's good to have an enemy. He makes you think, he will tell you things, that no one else will tell you. The adversaries stop you from being merely inert. That's the role of postmodernism. Because it's very critical. But things can go too far. When things go too far, they reverse. Hopefully, they'll reverse soon. Is the nature of totalitarianism nowadays more feminine than masculine? Slash lessons in parenting. So, totalitarian form of the past has been mailed to us. But maybe we're seeing something different now. It's not different. It's of a common kind, that's expanded in its dominion. There's an essential feminine pathology, as a masculine pathology. Freud mapped the feminine pathology, it's the Oedipal mother, it's the mother who gets too close to his children, that in her attempts to protect them, undermines them fatally. The Western representation it's Mary. It's lovely, derived from the story of Mary and the snake in Eden. Mary has his foot on a serpent, and hold Christ. That's what mothers have always done. It's a biological portrait of human women. They hold their infants out of the predators. But adults aren't infants, and either are children. And if you treat them as if they were, you undermine them. You turn them into old infants. That's the Freudian nightmare. You can be tangled in a terrible relation with your father. Because he was, absent, abusive or tyrannical. But the standard pathology with mom. She did everything for you. So, what's left for you to do? Including never leaving. She's only is a nurture of infants. Like the, feminist postmodernists. They complained about the absence of gender reality. And act out the archetypal devouring mother. At exactly the same time. For them the world it's divided by predators and infants. Predators are evil and need to be stopped, and infants need to be cared for. That's what the mother does. But adults are not infants. All you do is destroy them when you treat them that way. Especially in adolescent, when they develop. Don't do anything for your children that they can't do themselves. I'm gonna stop doing everything I possibly can for you as rapidly as I possibly can. That's what you do in an old age home. Do not do anything for the inhabitants that they can do themselves, because you rob them of the last vestiges of their independence. If you are a good manager, you make yourself superfluous. By extending autonomy and independence to your people. So, they can take over the whole job. You don't do that, by doing everything to people. In fact, you can't protect people, you can only make them strong. Then they can protect themselves. But then they don't need you. And that's the underground pathological element of the devouring mother. This is the deal. I'll do everything for you. But never leave. Only facilitate their independence. It's useful to have a mother and a father. Because the mother has to fall insanely in love with the infant. Or she throw it out the window. Because they are insanely demanding and they're always right. Before nine months, you do everything for them, you're always right in your knees, you'll take priority on them, and everything that threatens them it's terrible. But once the kid it's ambulatory and independent. Throw them into the world. Men are less prone to negative emotions, less compassionate, are better fostering that independence. So, when they start playing with the children's rough and tumble. Push them and saying, you can do it. But the mother it's very hard to play both those roles. Because for her it's difficult to be care devour and disciplined at the same time. Because the roles run contrary to one another. But now women have entered the political sphere. So, they will bring their essential nature with them. The wild saying. There's no such a thing as essential nature. It's like haha, yeah, there is. Can we revive the state of Western civilization using the Nietzschean idea that God is dead? The right question would be. Do you have problems in your life that you're not addressing that you could solve? You sit on your bed one morning, 
and say. There are things that need to be done, that I don't want to do, that I could do, that will make things better by the end of the day. What are those? You will know right away. So, ask to yourself, how do I entice myself into do them? And if you ask, instead of forcing yourself to do it, like a tyrant slave, you can negotiate yourself to yourself to start doing them. Sort your house in order and move on. There are things that are within your grasp that you could fix. Fix them and you'll learn how to fix things. You have your problems, everyone does, fix them. As a clinician, you need to learn how not to take the catastrophes of your clients to home with you. Because it's immoral to. There are not your problems. Their problems, their life. Your problems are your life. You don't want to solve someone else's problems, because you take away the deep meaning that it's to be found in having them go through their problems on their own. And then you steal the credit. Maybe, but then they won't be able to fix the next problem. Sort out the problems right in front of you. It will make you grow very rapidly. And then you'll be able to sort out more complex problems, without making them worse. Doesn't there need to be a higher creator to order the chaos of the world? We don't understand what we are, our own consciousness. It has a quality of some sort. It manifests itself within us, it's an orientation towards the good. Freedom to do evil but in orientation towards the good. So, you participate in that transcendent element of you, while you try to speak the truth and sort out the world, it serves as a guide. What's your opinion on cultural appropriation? Slash excursion to pornography use. My opinion in alt-right. And cultural appropriation. Absolute nonsense. There's no difference between cultural appropriation and learning from one another. The idea that manifesting in your own behavior some element of another culture. The idea that somehow that's immoral is insane. It's one of the bases of peace. The best thing that people have to share to each other, it's the value of their culture. Like. Hip-hop has an element of aggressiveness, that it's a necessary corrective, to the insistence that the highest moral virtue of a modern man is harmlessness. It's absurd, women don't like harmlessness men, they hate them. Women want dangerous men who are civilized, and they want to help civilize them. That's Beauty and the Beast. Book, A Billion Wicked Thought. A study of internet searches. They looked about pornography use. Male pornography, it's easy to understand, they are very visually oriented, what attracts them to pornography it's straightforward. You can tell that if you look a graffiti in a men's washroom. It's like two circles and a triangle. And the men are absolutely transfixed by it. For women, pornography tends to be literary. Because women then to like words more than visual stimuli. So, they try to find the archetypal structure of female pornography. Like Harley Quinn. The Taming of the Wild Men, by the Desirable and Virgilian Women. If you think women don't like that. Then, better come with a better explanation for Fifty Shades. The most rapid-selling novel in human history. And emerged at the same time, that all the noise about the absence of gender roles produced in mass. The perfect female fantasy is archetypical correct. It's Beauty and the Beast. The female pornography fantasy was. Wild guy, careless about the wants and desires of others, attractive to everyone, for high status, tamed by the magic of a single woman and brought him into a relationship with her. The most desirable male entity uses in female pornography. Vampire. Werewolf. Billionaire. Surgeon. Pirate. What's your opinion on the alt-right and nationalism? It's incomplete, it's identification with the father. That's necessary. But the purpose of identification with the father is to become the son. In all his symbolic manifestation. The problem with nationalism. Forgets that the purpose of the nation is to give rise to the individual. So, because our identities have become fragmented. There is a call to reconstitute the father. That's at the core of the alt-right. The downside is. The continual proclivity to degenerate into anti-Semitism. Alt-right says. The left it's trying to expand the dominion of the state. And the state it's a pathological monster. What we should do is to become nationalist. As long as the radical left keep pushing the way they keep pushing. Alt-right it's going to continue to grow. Is it possible that things like cultural appropriation are actually tactical constructs by postmodernists slash Marxist as think tanks? That opens the door to conspiracy. But. In any coherent philosophy there's an emphasis to action. And postmodernism has it. Imagine there's a core of central concerns. Some postmodernist only understands fragments of that core concern. So, if you take an SJW third year, women study student. You might say, she's only 15% postmodernist and 85% still human. But if you get 20 people like that together. And there's enough of the postmodernism doctrine that fills the room. Because it's fragmented into different people. Then, you have a coherent spirit that animates the group. So, 
it will act as if it has the intelligence of the philosophy. And it will manifest itself as if it is conspiratorial. So, you should always have to assume stupidity before you assume organized malevolence. Because organized malevolence it's rare and requires a lot of skill. But where it's only distributed stupidity that can act as conspiratorial without having to have a conspiratorial agent. I know you from 4chan and everybody loves you. What are you? I've been trying to solve a problem. I have done everything I can to try to solve that problem. I've been talking about what I learn. And to who I learn it for 30 years. That's had positive impact onto the people I taught it. I'm someone who's trying to solve the hardest problem that he could find. Do you think that individuals today should have a renewed relationship with religion and God? Yes, absolutely. But it has to be predicated on higher consciousness. This is how our religion systems develop. If you look at the structure of a chimpanzee troop, or a wolf pack. There's ethic, otherwise they will kill each other. The chimpanzees in their dominance hierarchy, learn how to act out a society, just like the wolves do. Rule for a wolf. Wolf 1 wants to be top dog, wolf 2, as well. They snarl at each other, they look big and ferocious, turn sideways to scare at each other, and one of them chicken outs, that wolf it's over and show his neck. That's the acting out of I'm a useless supplicant, your majesty can do what he will with me. And the wise king will say, well, I might need your useless body tomorrow. I could tear out your throat but I won't. So, they both get up and get along in the pack. That's an ethic. Another ethic. Juvenile male rats. They need to play, rough and tumble or they will develop attention deficit disorder. If you take a juvenile rat, and he know he's gonna be able to go to on a space to play. He'll work to open a door to enter that place. That way you know he's motivated. So, you let two rats from the same age go play to that space. But if one rat is 10% bigger. First, the rats will wrestle. If you pin the other rat you'll win. So, if you're 10% bigger, you always win. So, the big rat becomes dominant and the little becomes subordinate. They wrestle and then they part. The next time they meet. The little rat has to ask the big rat to play. Play stands. Then they play. If you pair them repeatedly. The big rat has to let the little rat win, at least 30% of the times. Or the little rat won't invite him to play anymore. Discovered by Pank Sep. Also, if you tickle rats, they giggle. And he discovered the play circuit. So, there's a emerge of etiquette play, fair play ethic. There's an ethic that emerges from social interactions. Because we are conscious, we watch that ethic emerge. So, we start telling histories about it. We tell histories about the honorable person. The honorable person, who just doesn't win today games, but also wins it as a way that everyone invites them to play games infinitely into the future. The meta player. That's what you're trying to be. The hero who goes to the unknown. The person who acts with proper interactions with other people. It's an emergent ethic. And we map that, and that's associated with our consciousness. So, we need to understand these things in order to put a biological structure underneath our religious thinking again. And to tie it into our scientific knowledge. To become aware of these things. To re-establish the foundation underneath our culture. Also, I don't understand this. On my talks, 80% are men. Why is that, something it's going on here? It's an indication that men and women have different interests. 91% of my viewers are men. And men don't come to this sort of things. So, there's something specifically in this for men. Because women don't want useless men. Although if you have a useless man, you get to dominate him. So maybe that's not such a big price to pay to having someone around that you can treat like an infant. That's the downside between the war between men and women. But a woman with any sense, wants a man who's dangerous but tame. Could you elaborate on intelligence and its role in university selection? If you look at the Harvard record. In 60s, the typical IQ was 105 to 110. Because they were finished school for the rich. If you have a rich father, who made his money, he was probably well above average in IQ. But if you're his offspring, there's regression towards the mean. Anyway. Now the average is 145 IQ. Because they're selected by the SAT. It's an IQ test. The average IQ is just moving upwards. Also, the average IQ of the population has increased over the last 50 years. Because of improved nutrition and information exposure. So, the general IQ has increased like the University of Toronto. The IQ is 120 to 130. Because you're selected by cognitive progress, because grades are rough marker of intelligence. Conscientiousness also matters. The best predictors are intelligence and conscientiousness. Not creativity BTW, zero correlation. Why do you think Western culture is committing suicide? Guilt. 
there's a lot for people to be guilty about. To what degree you should bear the horrendous guilt of your ancestors? I suggest. Take responsibility for your life. And understand that what you have, came at a terrible cost. And that you have an ethical obligation to use it properly. It's reprehensible, that the radical left, dares to attribute to ethnically identify groups as collective guilt. That should be rejected out of hand. Part of your wealth is a consequence of historical catastrophe. So, you should try to sort that out, for everyone's benefit. But not necessarily because you are more guilty personally. You are guilty as hell personally, but also is everyone else. Question about government mandated language, French in Canada, no English in Quebec. The right to communicate should be as untrammeled as possible. But I can't formulate the right answer right now. What's your opinion on safe spaces and the concept of white privilege? Slash supportive letters from transgender people. The idea of white privilege. It's absolutely reprehensible. Most people have privilege and works to deserve them. But the idea that you can target an ethnic group with a collective crime. Regardless of the specific innocence of guilt of the elements of that group. There's absolutely nothing more racist than that. You should read about the Kulaks. They were very productive farmers, the most productive elements of the agricultural in Russia. They all were killed, robbed, raped by the collectivist. Just because they show signs of wealth. They were classified as criminals and robbers. One of the consequences of the prosecution of the Kulaks was the death of six million Ukrainians, they starved to death, because there were no agricultural. The idea of collectively held guilt at the level of the individual as a legal or philosophical principle is so damn dangerous. So, just a cursory glance at 20th century history will teach how exactly unacceptable that is. I have received 25 letters from trans people. They all say the same thing. One those people do not speak for me. Two we are not all the same. Three most of us thinks, that the pronouns issue is doing nothing, it's only drawing negative attention to us. Four most of us, just want to be referred by the other pronoun. So, there's no evidence whatsoever. About this nonsensical legislation idiocy behind it? In fact, is not demanded by this community. Or that in any way be in anyone's best interest. And if you need a safe space. See a therapist. University is not a safe space. If you want to go somewhere to get yourself taking apart intellectually, and hopefully then put back together. Go to university. Everything you believe should be challenged. Not in a destructive sense. That's what postmodernists do to adolescence. You need to be espoused to things that you fear and hate. That's where salvation lies. Is there anything to ground our confidence in the logos? Yeah, two things. One the testimony of the ages. Two practical experience. You start by fixing the things that you can. The embodied manifestation of the logos, BTW that's why Christ was a carpenter, Archie typically speaking, because he fixes things, there's truth in being a carpenter. The next thing. You can't speak the truth. Because no one can. But you cannot say things you know to be lies. That's a good place to start. When you say something false. You won't be able to stand up straight. You'll feel weak inside you. Partly shame. You're failing to bear the burden of your existence and you're reviling that to yourself by deceiving. Stop saying things that you know to be false. And watch what happens. It can be proved. It can only be proved in the confines of your life. So, you have to sacrifice your life to the logos in order to find out. Because the only way you test it, is by acting it out and see what happens. You can't get to do it twice. The consequences will reveal to you quickly. Stating things more clearly, trying to make things better. At least make the horrible things bearable. And sometimes, makes mediocre things way better. As they get more confident and straighten things around them. So, it's the testimony of the ages and your willingness to test it existentially in your own life. You'll find that there isn't more interesting thing that you could do. Because it takes the stultifying predictability out of your life. You never know what would happen if you say something that's true. Miracles will happen. It's crazily interest. You got that to set against tragedy.